I'm just looking at it, remembering phone calls with Frank, like, <laughs> like, uh, like, uh, hey, Frank, do you think on this piece you could use a little deeper box? And he would say, Dennis, don't ever call me again. Click. <laughs> that's like, that was my relationship with Frank. I think I, um, and I think there's real benefit to this. You know, there's downsides, but I think there's real benefit to this. I think I weigh, I overweigh talent. So, so when I kind of go, I know I'm talking to genius. However they respond to me, I'm, I, I do my best to laugh and keep on talking. You know what I mean? There is no kind of, you know, this guy that offends everybody else doesn't offend me. And it, I think it's because I'm looking in and I'm seeing like, you guys have no idea what she can make or what he does with his hands or how they hear something, you know? And, and that was like my relationship with Frank, like Frank Lacey, who made all this gear. Frank, um, <clears throat> I got turned on to Frank when I moved uh, my studio and stuff to Mississippi by a bunch of the Memphis people who really knew what they were doing, like people like Terry Manning and the, uh, John Fry and Jody up at Ardent, all those people. And they're just going, this guy Frank's a genius and he's, uh, he's working in the, in the anechoic chamber at the University of Mississippi right now. It's like Oxford, that's where I was. And I'm like, here I am there with a Neve console and all this gear and stuff. And I go, who am I gonna get to work on it? And I'm thinking I'm gonna have to get people to drive down from Memphis but they start telling me about this guy, Frank. So I track him down. I talk to him. He, he's not uh, a people person. He's not super psyched to talk about doing any other work than working at the university like he's doing. But we get to be friends and he gets where he, he agrees to come by the studio and see what I got and talk about it. And he comes by and sees the Fairchild. I remember he worked on the Fairchild once. He sees the console, he sees my stuff, and he goes, do you have schematics on everything? He goes, I know how to work on all this stuff. I go, you do? He goes, oh yeah. I go, do you have schematics and everything? Uh, he asks me, and I go, uh, yeah, I, go, I do actually. And things I don't have, I can get, you know, they're findable in the world. And he goes, okay, I'll do it. I'll work on your, I'll be your tech. You know, in my off time kind of thing. I go, that's all I need. My stuff works good. My console came fully commissioned from Brent Averill, so I didn't have to, it came working perfectly. It, not a click, not a scratch, you know what I mean? And that was part of the deal. I guess I should have said that in another segment. Very sorry, all you Frank Lacey fans, you had to suffer with that. But anyway, the, uh, So Frank started working on my stuff, and in, in the early days of that, he tells me, yeah, because I, you know, I, I also build gear. I don't know if you know that. And I go, no, I didn't know that. He goes, well, I've made a lot of the stuff Terry Manning uses. And so that was like ZZ Top, I don't know, Big Stars, a lot of cool stuff Terry had done. And he goes, yeah, Terry, I make outboard gear for Terry. It's the things he wants, you know, like, t like uh, it was sort of this thing of like an era where things like Poltex and LA-2As were kind of long gone, and the modern replacements were, were inferior. I, I don't want to name any names, Tube Tech, but Tube Tech sounded kind of shitty compared to a real pull tech. And Frank and Terry Manning knew that, and so Frank came up with, an, with a, uh, yeah, it's down, a couple of them down in there somewhere, with these essentially would work like a pull tech tube that were amazing, you know, really good sounding, like you're easily in league with Pultec and you're more controllable. It's newer, new capacitors, all that sort of stuff. So Frank brought over some of his gear. I started trying, it was amazing. And so I got really into it, as one might <laughs> surmise, but also I saw it as an advantage. Like here I am with this, being this guy in Mississippi with this studio in Mississippi and I already kind of got a bent way I look at music and I'm making these kind of bent records. And if I'm kind of getting, if I have gear I can kind of pull from and get sounds and little tints to it that other people aren't doing, and I do that consistently across records, I'm seeing that as maybe more branding, more valuable for me, you know? And, and like, I like it and I'm using it and I like it. So I, I go, this is kind of smart for me to lean into, I felt like. And so, um, 
so you know, I, I, I started doing things. Like we, at one time we had a, uh, uh, an 1176 that I just loved. Things sounded great on a whole lot of stuff. And I was doing a record somewhere else, and who was, I think, Walkman came and did a record at my studio because I was working away. And I, and I check in with, the t with my tech one day, and he goes, oh, we sent the, 1176 was acting a little funny, so we sent it over to Frank to fix it. I go, no, 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 how is it sounding funny? I go, I love that thing. It broke? And he goes, no, it's just a little bit fuzzy on background. I go, no, I love that. Is it too late? So I call Frank, and I go, Frank, did you change that 1176? He goes, oh, yeah, I just fixed it. I go, oh, it had this amazing thing to it. I go, I was using it. Every time I wanted this thing on background vocals, I went to that 1176. You know what I mean? I go, he goes, well, you know, I still have the chip. It was a bad this, it was a bad whatever it is, not even necessarily a chip. It was a bad uh, whatever it was. And uh, he goes, I still have the parts that were causing the problem. He goes, would you be interested in me making another 1176? And I put that part in it. And then I could even put a switch on it and you could take it in and out. And I go, yeah, that sounds great. Let's do that. And so he made that. That's one of these. It's, uh, he, he, he put in the name of it. And he, so he made it into one. And you can tell which one it is because, oh, yeah, he put, uh, it's the CLDEF11. And the DEF stood for defective. So he put the defective part in it. So it's an 1176 with a defective part. The DEF 11. <laughs> It sounded amazing. It sounded as good as the, as the 1170. And now we had an 1176 that was back to, you know, full working condition. So it was kind of a win in the end. Yeah, there's some great mic pre's too. Like, the, as the relationship went on, and as, you know, if Frank had a slow couple weeks coming up or something, he'd come to me and go, is there some piece of gear you've been thinking about buying or you wished you had in the studio you don't have? And I go, well, you know, like, Maybe an SSL, standalone SSL bus compressor. I go, I've been kind of wanting that sound sometimes and to use it on the back end of the knee of mixing or something. And he goes, oh, I could make a better one of those. I'm like, yeah, but you know, the, the way, like an SSL bus compressor, the classic one, I think it's the E one, whatever, they, they roll off, the, they filter off the top and the bottom. And I knew when Frank said he'd make it better, he'd extend it out. I go, but yeah, but that's part of the, uh, <clears throat> that's part of the SSL sound. I guess part of what makes it sound cool is it's doing a little bit of filtering and you get louder. You know, it gives you more headroom. And he goes, well, I could do that. I could even do it where you could control if you wanted to go higher or not, you know. I go, what if you did one that's just really the SSL, kind of has that same SSL thing, but, you know, Frankify it, you know, make it, you know. G g g g give me that edge. Give me some edge, man. I go out and I'll be into it. It sounds good. And so he did. He, ma he, uh, he made this little SSL-ish baby. But yeah, we, it worked out great. Use it all the time. The, the uh, attack and release and the ratio work the same as an SSL. You know, you can trust them the same numbers. If you're used to an SSL and you can use the same numbers, this just kind of has it's just, it, you know, it just sounds a little bigger and a little more, uh, you know, a uh, full frequency response. But it also still has that SSL characteristic EQ to it. Cool. But he made all kinds of stuff. Like, we thought up a couple of weird things. There's a stereo analog filter down in here somewhere. It's just an insane piece of gear. Envelope follower. I mean, you can turn, you turn the knobs the right way on that and you can get no sound out of it. Like, it will go completely silent. That's how wild that thing is. So if you imagine what the opposite of silent is, it does that too, you know. <laughs> you, know you know, one thing with that, it's like, in the racks, in the room, I knew, I, that's how I knew them. I got to where I just kind of knew them that way. Like, oh, there's the kind of, the UA-175 ones, which I think are those. Or maybe that one. That's what I'm saying. The, uh, oh no, that's the two mic pre. Whew. That's good. But the, uh, but yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, I'll do my best. We'll see how well yeah, I do. One, 
those are those are great. They've been on a billion famous singers that I've been around. They've they've been on most of them. The uh, these two limiters are tube, and they're based on UA 175s, which I have a couple of UA 175s, and those are great compressors, and I liked them. So these are kind of based on that. Frank made uh, solid state and tube mic uh, and tube pre's, and I think these are a couple different, uh, three different uh, inceptions of the solid state mic pre's, which sound amazing. They're really fast in the front, so they're really good with transients. If you want something to kind of hit a little more, like you want a snare to speak the right way without EQ, things like that, just outstanding solid state pre's. Yeah, I don't know. We got all of it. I was, uh, I think, um, I think I overweigh talent. I think I led with that. <laughs> I overweigh talent, and it's like Frank was one of those people where you go, yeah, this is this guy can really do a thing that is uh, unique. You know, I, I was. I mean, just just two or three people, and uh, we even through Sweet Tea tried to kind of help a little bit, uh, sell sell his gear and get other people aware of it, just to kind of help him. To where I, I always I lived in dread of him moving away from Oxford, and then I lose. It's not like I could go to the other seven guys in Oxford who do this. <laughs> he was the only guy, so I was like, I wanted Frank to stay there. That was just an amazing resource for me. So I would try to steer other people to his gear. I remember Joe Zook got some. I don't know, I'm not remembering names of other people who were into his stuff. There were two or three other people who would mention it to me or who I knew were into it. Or, and well, yeah, and, and to my knowledge, he sort of flamed out on it. Like I think he got a, I think he got sort of a, a straight gig somewhere, you know, like one of those things where a Raytheon, <laughs> you know, paid him enough to just show up there every day and be a, a electronics genius yeah. that he just got kind of goes, ah, I don't want to deal with the music business anymore or whatever. I mean, he, you know, he was, uh, yeah, he, yeah, he, he was, he and I, could deal with each other really well, even though he'd sometimes kind of, you know, uh, get upset with me or something. We could, we could deal with each other good, but in trying to have my studio manager get things to him or pick things up or describe a problem to him or whatever, he just had no tolerance ability for that kind of stuff. And so he just wasn't really meant, he should be in one, one gig dealing with one set of people every day, given specific tasks. That's, that's his brain, I think, really liked that. Howard was like a beautiful guy. Just really a sort of voluptuously cool person, like kind of, you know, just really, when he was, when he was charmed by an environment, he was just wowed by that. You know, he's just like a really interesting personality. And Frank was virtually the opposite. Like, I would invite him to gigs. You're like, you know, he'd want to, you know, we'd be a record we'd be working on, and he'd think it was cool. And I go, hey, they're going to play at the little 200-seat place in town. You should come out, Frank, and Frank would come. And Frank would be grinning the whole time and stuff. But then the next day he'd call you and goes, yeah, that was, what a nightmare. It's so, so terrible. And somebody blocked me in where I was parked. And please don't invite me ever again to any of these things. And you're like, Okay, yeah, you know. And then the next one, I'd invite him and he'd come. And it's just like, you know, this is just a not, it's not his thing. And I don't say that to bad, right? I'm not saying this is bad. I just think some people are more socially adjusted than others. But that doesn't mean he couldn't build cool shit. When I, well, so when I met Frank Lacey, he, he lived in Oxford. And I don't think he was really making much gear for Terry Manning anymore. But that was his inception. That was his origin story. And uh, Terry had essentially sponsored him to make gear for him that Terry wanted. And Terry's son was named Lucas. 
And so Terry requested, asked Frank if he would name all the gear Lucas after his son. And so Frank goes, sure. So it's all called Lucas when he was making it for Terry. And I think these were designs he came, to, came up with while he was working for Terry. But then, so he comes to Oxford, kind of isn't making stuff so much for Terry. I get him to make a, a, he shows me a couple things, they sound great, I buy them, you know. But like, then he's going to start making more gear and stuff, and I, I start talking to him like a friend. Like, I go, Frank, you know, if you're not making stuff really from Terry's back anymore, you should come up with your own name. He goes, oh, you want me to call it Sweet Tea Gear, like my studio? And I go, no, 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 like your name. You can call it Frank. Frank Audio or something, and he goes, okay, I'll think about that. And he started naming everything JFL Audio, which is J. Frank Lacey. And so that's kind of why there's different names. But, and he stuck with the JFL thing, I think, pretty well, you know.